Hello, my name is Doron Scher. I work in Sydney, Australia, where we have a fantastic healthcare system. I'm a knee and shoulder orthopaedic surgeon. I specialize in sports surgery, joint replacement and reconstructive surgery, and I also treat a lot of work-related injuries. I have a very wide range of patients from young fit athletes all the way through to elderly patients who are much more frail. But regardless of the patient's age, the principles of healing remain the same. My involvement with low carb eating started many years ago when I was trying to help my overweight knee replacement patients lose weight to delay or avoid surgery. Together with Dr. Paul Mason, we started a metabolic weight loss clinic and have seen great success helping patients lose weight reduce their inflammation, and improve their health. But a healthy diet is not just good for people to lose weight and improve their metabolic health. It can also facilitate recovery after someone has had an operation. A great example of this is a knee replacement. It's one of the best operations we do in terms of providing pain relief and getting people going again. But the first few weeks, it's pretty tough to get through. So every little bit that we can do to make it easier helps. My patients that have lost weight and restored their health seem to breeze through the operation much more easily than those who are metabolically unwell. There is strong evidence that the complication rates are much higher in patients who are obese. Well, when we think of hospitals, we think of a place that you go to get healthy. They are where you go when you're sick or you're injured. You go in with a problem and you come out healed. We shouldn't be getting sick while we're in hospital. And yet, in this day and age, with all the information available on the harmful effects of sugar, the one thing you can be guaranteed of is that you'll be fed sugar in hospital. This is a constant uphill battle for those of us trying to change the system. Let me take you through a surgical day. So, you, the patient, are given instructions not to eat and drink for a specific period of time. This is really important to make your anaesthetic safe. We don't want any of your stomach contents ending up in your lungs while you're under. You have your operation. All goes well and you wake up in the recovery room. There's usually some pain, but this is well controlled by painkillers. Unfortunately for some people, the painkillers make them feel a bit sick, but this is far less common with the modern drugs these days. The staff in the hospital know that you've been fasting, so as soon as you're properly awake, they want to give you something to eat. Solid food can be a bit difficult to stomach right after an anaesthetic, so they give you something you can suck on. The problem is that what they give you is frozen sugar. While it's nice and cool and refreshing, what do you think it's going to do to your blood sugar? A huge number of our patients these days have insulin resistance and diabetes, and spiking your blood sugar is definitely not optimal when it comes to wound healing and avoiding infection. So you go out of recovery and you go back to the ward where you're typically offered a white bread sandwich and a fruit juice, again guaranteed to spike your blood sugar. So here you are as a patient, you've spent time under anaesthetic, you're now lying in bed resting, which basically means you're in a catabolic or breakdown state. That means you're losing your valuable muscle protein, which you desperately need to recover from your operation. Now this is a picture from a different hospital. In this one, you get an icy pole, fruit juice, biscuit, sandwich, and an ice cream. But luckily the ice cream is gluten free. So that makes it much better. Then I go see the patient the next morning, and this is typically what I find on their bedside table. They've been snacking on overnight. Soft drink and chocolate. Once more, spiking the sugars and creating inflammation in their bodies. The hospital breakfast in the, is then served with more fruit juice and breakfast cereal. And what's worse, diabetic meals contain a minimum of 30 grams of carbohydrate per meal. I now have a conflict. I want my patients to be eating so that they don't lose their energy, but I don't want them eating something which is going to spike their blood sugar. I also need them to activate protein synthesis, but so far, nothing that they've eaten after their surgery is capable of doing this. We'll talk more about this soon. <clears throat> it's well documented that high blood sugars lead to wo more wound infections. Infection after surgery is a very serious issue. If you're lucky, you might just end up with a few weeks on a drip, but often three or four operations can be required to get rid of a serious infection. I wonder why we don't treat our patients like our elite athletes who under expert care often seem to have superhuman recovery. Let me tell you, when I first approached the hospitals about this, um, about this topic about five years ago, I was basically told that as a doctor, I wasn't qualified to provide nutritional advice and that the dietitians decided on the patient's meals. Well, I'm very pleased to report that things have changed and in the private sector, at least as a doctor, I can specify what food I want my patients to have. 
But more importantly, as a patient, you can now choose what food you want to eat. And I'll come back to this. Let's talk about muscles. There are two basic types of muscle, smooth and skeletal. An example of smooth muscle happens in the background, like your heart, where it's just beating away and you don't have to tell it to do anything. Skeletal muscles move your bones and joints and require instructions to do so. As a skeletal, as a, as a tissue, skeletal muscle has a unique ability to grow in size in response to exercise. On the other hand, too much rest or immobility will lead to muscle wasting. Here you can see the massive difference in the quadriceps bulk following surgery and the subsequent period of enforced rest. This is an athletic individual who started with fantastic muscle bulk at the beginning, but has ended up with a much smaller thigh. Now, what about somebody elderly and frail who was already struggling to walk upstairs before the operation? How do you think they're going to go with their period of enforced inactivity? Let's look at a muscle cell under a microscope. You're going to see a striped pattern, otherwise known as striations. This pattern is formed by a series of basic units called sarcomeres, and they're arranged in a stacked pattern throughout the muscle tissue. They're repeated throughout the muscle, and there are thousands of sarcomeres in each muscle cell. Muscle is a specialized tissue which can change its length. So it can contract or shorten or lengthen. And it's the change in length of the proteins in the sarcomere that causes the muscle to change its length. From a microscopic level to now look at the muscle at a macroscopic level, we can see that each muscle is a whole organ made up of tiny individual muscle fibers labeled here as a myofibril. Within the muscle are blood vessels, nerves, and connective tissue. Looking at one close up, we can see it's long and cylindrical, and it's largely made of protein. Obviously, the unique thing about muscle compared to other body tissues is its ability to change length. In other, in other words, to contract or shorten. And of course, the action of contraction and relaxation uses energy in the form of something called ATP. Now, as I mentioned, skeletal muscles don't just contract by themselves. Rather, they need a signal, usually originating in the brain, which travels along nerves and stimulates the release of chemicals called neurotransmitters, which then are the ultimate signal for a muscle to contract. Intu intuitively, everyone knows that muscle is made of, of protein. In actual fact, we often refer to meat, which is muscle, as protein. But what actually is protein? The basic building block of a protein is called an amino acid. As we all know, if you join many glucose together, you form a complex car carbohydrate. Well, joining many amino acids together eventually forms a protein. If you join two amino acids, you get something called a peptide. And then if you have about 300 amino acids to 1,000 or so, that's called a protein. The proteins fold in a special way to give them a particular biological activity. Now, while these are very diverse and found all over the body with lots of different shapes and functions, I'm going to focus on skeletal muscle. This is the li a list of the major amino acids and the way they refer to as either a three letter or a single letter, depending on how you're writing them out. If it's a very long polypeptide, then usually just the single letter abbreviation is used to save space. Now, amino acids serve multiple roles in the body. They can form neurotransmitters so that the cells of our nervous system can communicate. Uh, they can make hormones essential for healthy function of, of our endocrine system. They can even do things like relax blood vessels, and in the case of nitric oxide, improve circulation. Importantly, as far as post-operative recovery of my patients is concerned, amino acids form the building blocks of muscle and stimulate synthesis of that muscle in the first place. Now, I think most of us have heard of essential amino acids. While all amino acids are necessary for life, some are not able to be um, made in the body. And for these amino acids, it's essential that we consume them, hence their name. The one that I particularly want you to notice is leucine in the top left-hand corner. I want to take a minute just to mention two things which are critical when it comes to protein regulation. They are mTOR and leucine. Now, mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. You need to think of it as the amino acid sensor of the cell. So simplistically, mTOR is activated when conditions are right for cell building, and mTOR activation results in muscle growth. So in order to grow and divide, cells must increase production of proteins, lipids, and nucleotides. This is known as anabolism, and also suppress breakdown pathways such as autophagy, which is known as catabolism.
I'm not going to spend any more time on mTOR other than to say mTORC1 plays a central role in regulating all of these processes and therefore controls the balance between the anabolism and catabolism in response to environmental conditions. Now the main driver for mTOR, uh, the main driver for mTOR is the amino acid that I mentioned previously called leucine. Leucine is essential, meaning that we have to eat it to get it into our bodies. The main sources of leucine are animal proteins such as meat, fish, chicken and dairy, but it's also found in other things like tofu and um, navy beans. Resistance training also does stimulate mTOR. But why is leucine so important? It seems that leucine is a bit of an on-off switch when it comes to protein synthesis. So when there's enough leucine, mTOR gets activated and protein production gets going. So if your meal has less than two grams of leucine, then as, and as, then as an adult, you will not get a metabolic response to build muscle. Having three grams is better than two grams, but having five grams or more does not really seem to be any better than having three grams. That is, it's not a dose response curve, it's more of an on-off switch. So in a nutshell, if you eat protein at a meal which does not re reach this leucine threshold, then what you eat can't be used for muscle building. So it's really excess calories. So if amino acids are the basic building blocks of muscle, how do we get them into our system? Because proteins are too large to be absorbed by our intestines. Well, the proteins need to be digested or chopped up. Some of this occurs in the stomach under the action of a chemical scissor, um, which is an enzyme which is assisted by the acidic environment. The proteins are then broken into smaller chunks called polypeptides by pepsin, which we saw earlier. Once the polypeptides reach the intestine, different enzymes begin to work on them to break them up and absorb them so they can be absorbed into the bloodstream. Remember that the major source of amino acids is actually reusing the stuff in the body, so not all of it needs to be ingested. So let's focus a little more, bit more on skeletal muscle. As you can see from this simplified diagram, the interactions take place at multiple levels, only some of which can be directly influenced by us. When a protein has been a while, around for a while, it tends to get damaged. This is particularly the case when blood sugar is high, and we know that that damage by AGEs or advanced glycation end products leads to the protein being broken apart and recycled. There is also the normal process of, of autophagy, which again, most of you will be familiar with, which is a bit like a routine service of your car. But in this case, the amino acids are broken down to their simplest level and reused again to make protein. So the maintenance of skeletal muscle mass is dependent on the balance between the rate of muscle protein synthesis and protein degradation. Protein is made in little factories called ribosomes. Their main function is to convert, convert genetic code into an amino acid sequence and to build protein polymers for amino acid monomers. The number of these units and the efficiency of the units determines how much protein is made. So the next logical question is how much protein do we need to eat to get the amino acids to survive? This slide is, a, is from a talk given by Don Lehman where he emphasizes the point that the recommended dietary intake is actually the minimum intake needed to keep you healthy and allow normal growth and development. This is by no means the desired intake if you're trying to build or maintain muscle mass. You also can't think of protein in terms of a percentage of your overall food, food intake, because if you're running at a calorie deficit in order to lose weight, the amount of protein intake will fall as the overall calorie intake falls. The problem is that you still need the same amount of protein in your body, or the body will start to lose lean body mass and muscle. The graph also shows you a very wide range of safe protein intake. As high as 200 grams of protein, which would equate to about a kilogram of steak, which would be very hard for anybody to consume. Already this weekend, we've seen an athletic young individual by the name of David Dykeman, who consumes about four grams of protein per kilogram of lean body mass, and he is in robust health. The blue X that you see is where most Ameri North Americans are in terms of their protein intake, well below the safe level. Now, building muscle is not a straightforward process. It requires the interaction of various enzymes and hormones. As an adult, there also seems to be the on-off switch with the leucine, only when the critical amount of amino acids are present in our system. As a child, however, hormones drive growth much more strongly, and even quite malnourished children will continue to grow reasonably well. 
and this is under the influence of IGF growth hormone and insulin. As you know, we tend to develop insulin resistance as we get older. This applies across all of our tissues, and in skeletal muscle this is the case as well, requiring more insulin to drive muscle growth as we age. This is why as, as adults, um, the hormone drive is less effective and requires other drives like leucine and mTOR to be involved. So where is this knowledge about amino acids and protein taking us, you ask? That's a great question. The body is in a constant state of flux, breaking down damaged or old proteins and making new proteins. The more time in the synthesis or making phase, the more lean body mass we have, and the more time in the breakdown phase, the less lean body mass we have. As a general rule, in the body, you either use it or lose it. The same applies to bone mineral density. At rest, protein breakdown exceeds protein synthesis. You may have heard the term of a negative protein balance. If your goal is to massively build muscle, then eating regularly and exercising regularly are very important. If you're just an average person, then the timing of the meals and the number of meals is far less important. We also need to keep in mind that if people are trying to lose weight, they will need to restrict their calorie intake, bad, break bad um, eating habits, and improve their overall health and inflammation. Fasting is a very powerful way to do this and is far more important than worrying about optimal muscle building. Technically, while you're fasting, technically while you're sleeping, you're fasting, and during this time you'll experience some muscle loss. Don't worry, organs like the liver keep working while you're sleeping, so the same rules don't apply there. The negative side of muscle loss is far outweighed by the benefits of sleep, so waking your, yourself up to eat or exercise is a very bad choice. Muscle loss will also occur with prolonged fasting, where you do get some loss of lean muscle mass. How, how much you lose also depends on how much other energy stores you have available in your body to burn, as the body will choose to burn glucose and fat before it burns muscle. Adding exercise to fasting, that is not adding amino acids or muscle building blocks, but just exercise, has only a small impact on the amount of muscle lost. What that means is exercising while fasting does not fully counteract the losses, but it does counteract some. You will still be in a mildly negative protein balance, despite exercise being an anabolic stimulus. On the other hand, if you stop fasting and eat protein during the meal, you will now achieve a positive muscle balance, which counteracts any fasting losses. It also, it also allows less loss of lean muscle at rest than you would experience without eating protein. If you then add resistance training to the mix, you can make more muscle than you started with. So it makes sense that the best combination of muscle building is exercise and having amino acids present at the same time. Now, I mentioned to you that you need insulin to make muscle, so some people interpret that as a need to eat carbohydrates with their protein. The amount of insulin actually required is very small, and extra carbs are definitely not needed when you're eating whole foods. A couple of years ago, we were involved in nutritional testing of various meat products. We were actually looking at the difference between grass and grain-fed, pasture-raised, etc., but the results took us by a little bit of surprise. The carbohydrate content of the meat was as high as 19% in some samples and as low as 3% in very young animals, but on average it was about 12%. Now if you think about the picture of muscle that I showed you having other structures and having glycogen, not just pure protein, then this does make sense. We know that you get an insulin spike eating protein, which is less than that of eating carbohydrates, and this to me explained why it was happening. It also meant that extra carbohydrates were not needed when eating protein for muscle building. This is even more important if you're metabolically unwell, when even a sniff of carbohydrate will put you into a fat storage mode. We also know that for most um, animal proteins, you will need to consume about 30 grams of protein to get 3 grams of leucine, because leucine is about 8% of most animal proteins. Remember, 20 grams of proteins is not a, is not a 20 gram steak, but out of about a hundred gram steak, fish, or piece of chicken. One of the most common questions with protein relates to kidney disease, and to understand this, you need to know that patients with kidney failure are put on a low protein diet. For these patients, restricting their protein does make them live longer, but it wasn't the high protein which caused the kidney disease in the first place. To my knowledge, there are no data linking high-protein diets to the development of renal disease, and certainly there are none in the quantities of protein intake we're talking about today. Now, backing away from the science a bit and coming to do to what I do on a 
um, day-to-day basis. We know that patients get muscle wasting after surgery. We also know that the most important event in the process of skeletal muscle recovery is the upregulation of the anabolic processes, followed by an increase in muscle mass and subsequently recovery of muscle performance. We know that muscles that experience atrophy during unloading are more susceptible to injury when they are reloaded and reweighted. This has very important implications when I'm trying to get a patient back to work or back to sport. So I want to share with you now my experience dealing with post-operative patients and I have made some changes for the better. It is an ongoing process, but I can report good progress at many hospitals. So now when my patients are admitted to hospital, they're given a food menu. This menu still contains all the sugar-containing options, but you don't have to choose them. In the past, if all you chose was the protein, you got a tiny serve of the protein with the expectation that the rest of the plate will be filled with the other rubbish that was available to you. Now, if you choose the protein, you can actually ask for a double or triple serve, which will not only provide satiety for you, keep your blood sugar low, but also get you to the point of reaching your leucine threshold to start building muscle to aid your recovery. Breakfast no longer has to be toast and cereal. Lunch no longer needs to be sandwiches and dinner no longer needs to be rice or pasta. Adding a full fat yogurt, cheese, bacon, salmon is a great way to kickstart your day. You can have chicken or tuna for lunch or even a salad and then meat for dinner. Never be scared to get your family members to bring in the type of food you like as well. If you're used to eating only once or twice a day, that's fine. But then just try, try to try, try to time your physiotherapy session for about half an hour after you've had your protein meal. This will turn the leucine switch on, activate mTOR and kickstart your muscle building process. So in summary, eating protein is safe. We do need to eat a certain amount of protein each day to build our lean muscle mass. If you want to recover from surgery and build your skeletal muscle, stay away from carbohydrates and fats and stick to protein combined with strength training. Just being in hospital does not mean you should lose control of your food choices. My job as a surgeon doesn't just stop once the wound is closed. Together, we need to get get you to heal, to recover and restore optimal function in the shortest possible time. Thank you for listening. Well, they're on certainly right about hospital food. I, every time I visit someone in hospital, I just get horrified. Uh, I had a friend recently who was in hospital, type 2 diabetic, and uh, his, every meal was just full of sugar. And, and there are dietitians employed by the hospital to, uh, to design these menus, and uh, I just don't get it. Look, it's actually quite bizarre, but I think there are movements changing. We obviously know Gary Fetke's story and the trouble he had with hospital dietitians. Um, but mm. when Duran went, actually, uh, I, I guess uh, he was, uh, you know, did it quite astutely, um, but he was able to bring the dietitians on the side and he didn't really have too much pushback at all. Um, so, you know, he's now in the situation now where his patients can get protein-rich food. So, And it wasn't just a matter of saying, oh, well, we'll just drop off the, the toast and you, you can have a single egg. It's like, mm. no, these guys might need three or four eggs. They can have a whole egg roll. They can have, you know, proper-sized meals that are nutrient-dense, full of protein and low sugar for those people with, uh, you know, glycemic control issues. So it, this is fantastic. And, I'm you know, I'm really hoping that his patients recover better because of it.